The story of stagnating wages is mostly wrong, according to a Bloomberg report uh, dated May 15th, 2019. This always interests me, actually, because uh, I, I don't know where I fall in this. I, uh, I do believe there is a lot of evidence that says the wages have not kept up with inflation in terms of uh, your purchasing power. But then I look around and I see the the vast abundance that most people have in the U.S. relative to what it was 25 years ago. I mean, so the wages may not have kept up, but certainly we have these things in our pocket. Everyone does. And, uh, and I also wonder, it's interesting. So let's dive into this. I think this will be interesting here. Um, I'm not convinced. And I'm not not convinced. And I've already read this article and I still kind of fall in the middle of the road here, but we shall see. Um, I, I do want to point out one of the things, well, let me just go. Let's, we'll just go with it and we'll comment as we see. A guy named Michael Strain uh, wrote this. I don't know who Michael Strain is, but uh, the story of stagnating wages was mostly wrong, according to Bloomberg, or at least Michael Strain. He's a uh, Bloomberg opinion columnist, uh, director of economic policy at AEI, American Enterprise Institute. Okay. Uh, wages have been stagnant for decades uh, for everyone except for those at the very top. How often have we heard this claim? Presidential candidates frequently assert it as fact, as do some prominent economists. And uh, he uh, quotes uh, Paul Krugman from the New York Times. The problem is, is more wrong than right. You can make a case for it, of course. First, you have to select a measure of wages. Let's go with the average hourly earnings of production and non-supervisor employees uh, provided by the BLS. About, about four and five people in the labor force are included in this group, and they can be thought of as roughly the worker, the worker folks, not the managers, and they, often, and they are often described as your typical workers. Second, you need to select a measure of price inflation to make an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of the purchasing power of wages in different economics or different years. Economists and analysts commonly select a CPI index research, and we talked about this a million times. The CPI UW, Urban Wages for Clerical Workers. Sorry, that's what it's called, CPI UW, uh, Consumer Price Index for Clerical Workers in the Urban Environments. Third, pick a period over which to make the comparison. It is common to go back to 1973, in part because of the incorrect assertion that this is the year a gap opened between worker pay and worker productivity. With these choices, wages have grown a measly 5%. That weak growth is reasonably described as stagnant. stagnant. Much here is driven by the relatively poor performance of wage growth during the 70s and 80s. Rather than going back five decades, though, let's go back three and compare wages today, what they were in July of 1990, a business cycle peak. That's interesting, actually. So the 70, I, you know, that's uh, actually, you know, I was born in 1970. So to use 1973 as your starting point, which is the beginning of the mass inflation of the 70s and, and into the mid 80s, that would decline the real purchasing power of your wages for sure. I, I that's uh I hadn't thought about it. That was actually quite interesting because is that an anomaly? Well, I think so. If you look at the graph of the interest rates of the U.S., it goes like this, and then it goes up, and then it comes back down. Uh, and what you'll see is the anomaly of the 10-year Treasury, 30-year Treasury in 1982, trading at 15 and 18% respectively, or, if, or uh, uh, the 10-year Treasury is at 18, the 30-year is at 15. And you can see quickly that that is not common for the U.S. It doesn't mean it can't happen again, but certainly not common. So to go back to 1973 is almost like a sequence of return risk. If you start your portfolio in 1973, you're doomed. If you start your portfolio in 1975, you're freaking, you know, you're hell on wheels. So it's interesting. Much here is driven by the, oh, we already talked about it. If we start there in the 1990, the business cycle peaked. So in 1990, we peaked and then it went over a small recession, which essentially is what got Clinton elected. If we start there and use the same wage series and inflation adjustment as before, we find that wages have grown by 20%. While that was slow compared with the gains enjoyed by the top 1% is a significant increase in purchasing power. I always hate the 1% thing. The idea that the same people in 1990, the 1% are the same people today, it's just it's stupid. It's dumb. Mark Zuckerberg is in the 1% now. He was not in the 1% in 1990. Jeff Bezos is in the 1% now. He was not in the 1% in 1990. It's just it ebb and flows who these people are. 
Um, you know, we, hell, we talk about Trump. I was just watching Norm Macdonald. Uh, in, uh, he was being interviewed by Larry King. He said he went bankrupt twice. Sometimes Norm was in the top percent, one, and sometimes he was not. There were two other arguments for going back three decades rather than five. Making apples to apples comparisons of the purchasing power of wages becomes more difficult the further you go back. Man, that's exactly right. How do you compare the price of a car in 2019 with one in 1973? Given the significant improvement in automobiles, how do you compare the price of a laptop in 2019 with one in 1973, given that none existed? I was just thinking about it like this. I mean, hell, the car I got in 2013 Toyota Highlander, uh, while it has Bluetooth, it still has six CDs. You can put six CDs in there, no has CDs anymore, and no backup camera. My 2010 Honda Odyssey has no backup camera and, or, I mean, in the six CDs and no backup camera and no Bluetooth. That's 2010. The car my wife has in 2018 Dodge Durango has all that stuff. Um, never, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you make those comparisons. When policymakers and opinion leaders argue that wages have been stagnant for decades, many people hear that was referring to their own wages, that is the wages of today's workers. This strengthens the argument for comparing today's wages with those of the early 1990s, or even more recently, rather than going back to the early 70s, when many of our today's workers were just kids. Exactly. So I'm 49 now. In 1973, I was three years old. I don't think I was working for a living back then. And so I was, I can't compare my wages today with what I was making in 1973 because I didn't have a job. The case for stagnation, in fact, just even think about it. My dad, my mom, whatever, they're both in their mid to late 70s, something like that. They're not working anymore. So to compare their earnings versus what they were making in their early 70s, is just stupid because there's two generations. So, he, I, so this is why I agree with this guy. Yeah, the American Enterprise Institute, I generally agree 80%, 85% of the time anyway. So I am biased in favor of their their take on things, but I think their take on things uh, is, is right, generally speaking. The case for stagnation story gets even weaker when you scrutinize the choice of the price index. The Federal Reserve and CBO prefer the personal consumption expenditures price index, the CPI, to the CPI research series. The PCE takes better account into consumers can substitute products in response to price changes. For example, if the price of strawberries go up, you might buy fewer strawberries and more raspberries. By not accounting for the uh, ability to substitute goods that are relatively cheaper, the CPI overstates inflation. That's interesting. So the BLS uh, is using uh, the, the, the prefer the to the CPI. The BLS is using a CPI research series, uh, which does not allow for substitution effect. In basic economics, we talk about substitution effect all the time, like this guy was just saying. I, I use it in firearms. If if you the 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 price of twenty two ammunition goes through the roof, you're going to buy more shotgun shells, for instance. Does that make sense? Um, and not that long ago, you couldn't find any nine millimeter. Uh, you couldn't find any nine millimeter rounds back in like 2009 and 10. Uh, you couldn't find any, so the price of nine millimeter rounds went through the roof. And uh, if you're a gun owner, you you sack you substituted nine millimeter with whatever you're buying. I mean, two two three, uh, you name it, or nothing. And if the CPI doesn't uh, uh, take that into consideration, it's actually overstating the inflation of the uh, of the firearms industry in terms of the price of the the bullets you're trying to buy using the pce the wages of a typical worker have increased by 32 percent over the past decades that's a significant increase in purchasing power so that's with inflation so you've increased by 32 percent over the last three decades above the rate of inflation that's real growth in your in your earnings for sure your uh, purchasing power what about the distribution of wages oh, i hate this rather than the average median wages for all workers, not just production and non-supervisory workers, grew by over 25% over the past three decades using the PCE deflator. Wages for the bottom percent grew by more than one third. So the bottom 20% actually grew higher than the median. That, see, that right there is interesting to me. Wages for the bottom 20% grew by more than one third, which is more than what the median did. And that, see, that shocks me because I just sit there and I think, um, with all the cheap labor we've been importing into this country, that's I, uh, that, that's interesting. I, I, I was, I don't want to say stunned, I was, but I was taken aback to read that. The wages grew by over uh, more than the median. While wages are the most important component of a worker's total comp compensation, they are not the only component. Man, I agree with that 100%. Employer-provided health insurance is typically a worker's most important non-cash benefit. Yep. It's been increasingly expensive for businesses to buy for workers. Yep. 
When you factor in benefits, the story about stagnating income is even weaker. You might argue what really matters is the flow of resources a household can use for consumption and savings, whether or not those resources come from paid employment. The CBO computes a comprehensive measure of income that includes, but is not limited to, wages, salaries, fringe benefits, capital gains and dividends, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid benefits, unemployment insurance, food stamps, and federal tax payments. So transfer payments inclusive. And using this measure, median household income grew by 43% from 1990 to 19 to 2015, the last year in which the data is available. All right, that's uh, households in the bottom 20% saw their incomes increase by 62%. So I mean, literally, households in the bottom. 20% saw their meet their their income increase 50% more than the median. That's nuts, man. I'm not trying to be sang, sanguine, sanguine, something like that here. Americans have high, high expectations for wage and income growth, and we shouldn't be satisfied with the gains we've enjoyed over the past three or five decades. We need better policies that allow workers, particularly those at the bottom, to command, command higher pay. And slow wage growth after the Great Recession frustrated and scarred too many workers. But messages matter. If people hear that all that if all people hear is that wages have been stagnant for decades as part of the game is rigged to benefit the top, well, they might believe it, and they are. And they might, in fact, act on what they believe, lowering their aspirations, reducing their effort in the labor market. On the other hand, if they hear that slow and steady wage gains have produced significant increases in purchasing power over the last second decades, they might feel more optimistic. At a minimum, they might have a better understanding of what's actually been happening in their communities and society over these past many years. So let's look at some of the comments. Some of the comments are just they're, they're silly. Uh, in fact, I'll show you. I think this one guy's comment shows, uh, uh, let's see if we can bring this up here. He, uh, right here, this guy, Delta V. He says, huh, we might also look at real wages adjusted for labor productivity, which shows that wages are down by a third since 1990. While real productivity adjusted wages have been shrinking, housing, healthcare, and education costs have been skyrocketing. The net effect has removed about two trillion uh, from consumers' products. And then he gives us a stupid Upton Sinclair. I like the article, the Upton, the quote, the Upton Sinclair quote, but it has nothing to do with this. Uh, but anyway, so he uses a quote, a quote from the St. Louis Fed. I just find it funny. This guy says. <laughs> I find it amusing. Those challenging, you don't see how lower compensation, uh, uh, right, right here. Uh, right. To be fair, you have to show that the above calculation didn't include one of the factors discussed in the above article, which drove up their estimations of average work wages. You simply cut and pasted a chart ignoring this and then claim the article was totally off base. <laughs> exactly. You then posted a quote from Upton Sinclair. To boot, just because real wages adjusted for labor productivity are down, that does not mean workers have not increased their purchasing power. I could not agree with that more. Just because wages relative to productivity have, <laughs> have dropped, their purchasing power has still increased. What does that mean? That means they probably should be more entrepreneur capitalistic than to take their increasing productivity to get out of working for the man and go start their own gig. But just because one thing happened doesn't mean the other thing. It's like always just ah, <laughs> just because real wages adjusted for labor productivity are down does not mean workers don't have increased purchasing power. The chart just says relative to rate labor productivity, real wages haven't gone up as fast. Productivity up went faster than wages. I, I, I just it's inherently makes sense. You have more tools at your fingertips to increase your productivity. Just because your wages haven't jumped with an increased, massive increase in technical productivity doesn't mean you're any worse, less off. It's, ah! Overall, purchasing power within the economy can still be the same or higher, even if the workers earn less of the gain in productivity, especially when the product quality is improving. I just 100%, whoever wrote this, Seattle Slim. Uh, the chart isn't, in conclusion, this chart isn't indicating wages are falling or that the author was wrong. Sadly, at this point, seven others have liked the comment despite its total lack of critical support itself for understanding the data you presented. Um, and again, like this guy says, it's not clear why productivity and wages would rise at the same rate in the first place. This is a spurious claim that goes undefended by these, undefended by these mush brains. I, man, I completely agree. And here's this guy. He posted some St. Louis Fed chart and then he quotes from uh, up to, it's just, it's, it's embarrassingly simplistic. I just, ah. Uh. <laughs> Uh, I think I have you have a quote in here someplace. Let's see. Let's see what I said. I think I responded somewhere. I might not be able to find it. Let's see if I can go back up. 
And when it, it, stop being so simple. I, what I mean by that is, look, I get sort by best, sort by newest. Let's see what I say. Maybe I did. Oh man, I thought I did. All right. I guess not. I, I'm sure I had some quotes in there. I just don't know where they where they showed up. Yeah. Anyway, um. All right. They're in there someplace. Anyway. So at the end of the day, I am not at all. Um, This is a tough one. It's a tough one because if real productivity is increased and real wages have increased relative to your purchasing power, and we are living on the, I mean, just we are at the precipice, man, of, of just no one has lived better than us. People have been displaced, though. People have been displaced by cheap labor. That's a fact. And they're trying to import more cheap labor for more technical positions. These are not, this, you know, I interviewed my man Amar, who's an American, but his heritage is Indian, not Native American, but Indian. And he was telling me his job was displaced at, uh, I forgot what it was, by uh, being shipped over to India. Look, I think India is the next capitalist mecca. I love it over. I mean, I don't, I'm never going to go there, but I just think India is freaking. I mean, they speak English. They have a good work ethic. They're smart. Uh, you know, I, I mean, India is going to is going to dwarf China in just a matter of time, without question. Um, they play by a fair game. They've got rid of their socialistic tendencies that they had in the late '60s and early '70s, and even going on forward. I think India is the next uh, is, is the next capitalist. It's going to be incredible. And once they get freaking fossil fuels, which they're going to grow, uh, they're going to take off like a freaking bat out of hell. And I can't wait to witness that. Uh, but the concern I have is the facts are we a lot of Indians will, that come here will work for a hell of a lot cheaper than our own people. And I'm not sure that's good. Um, they come like everybody, the Irish immigrants, the Mexican immigrants before them, they, they work hard, they become citizens and they, you know, second and third generations become outstanding citizens, but first generations do too. Uh, I, but it's still, you got but there are people being displaced by this. And, uh, and that does bother me. I'm a capitalist. I get it. I get it. But it just, it bothers me when you're importing people to take the jobs of, of natives because they work for cheaper. And frankly, they probably work hard. I, I don't deny that. I mean, I, I hate to say it, those freaking Guatemalan guys that, you know, are on roofs or cooking food. I mean, I know these guys, they're freaking, they, they bust their butts. No two ways around that. And if they're doing under the table, I, I don't blame them. I don't even blame the businesses. It's just a freaking nightmare. That, and this is what's going on in Greece. They set up this nightmare scenario where to, to be follow the law, you have to jump through hoops like crazy. And at the end of the day, they said, ah, screw that. Just go to the black market. Uh, Hernando de Soto, The Other Path, I think is a book he had written about the Peruvian economy. And when you just look at it from the basic numbers of the government, you're like thinking, man, these guys are destitute. But there's a black market economy where real product uh, productivity is happening and taking place and lots of transactions, lots of growth. But if you but you got to but the black market is there because it's the government regulation is so strict that no one's going to do that. They're going to do just like they do Greece, which is just do it against the, uh, illegally. And the same thing happens. Here. What the hell do they think the drug trade is? I mean, my goodness, the cigarette trade. Why do you think that guy Eric Garner got killed? Because he's freaking selling cigarettes, a legal product as a grown man to individuals who were wanted to buy a legal product. He was selling cigarettes that individuals wanted to buy in pursuit of whatever they wanted to do. And the government said, you can't do that. And he died because of that. It's freaking insane, man. And that is the black market, the other path. So I don't know what to make of it. I, you know, I, I love immigration. Um, I love legal immigration. I also... I also respect the U.S. workers, too, who get displaced by mass amounts of immigration. So I, I just, I, it's one of those, it's one of those, there's no right answer. Um, and I don't think saying at the end of the day, hey, maybe we need to take a break here and think how this is going makes you racist or a xenophobe or anything like that. Um, not in the least. I, I think there is some valid arguments. I mean, hell, Milton Freeman, you're not going to find a bigger proponent of mass immigration than that guy. But even he said, as long as we have these welfare benefits, we can't have unlimited immigration. Even Milton Friedman said that. So I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, I, I do worry about the Americans being displaced by that, and, uh, and especially the laborers being displaced. And uh, so I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. But it's just, it was interesting nonetheless. Stagnating wages, if you look at it in the relative to real world scenarios has not been stagnating nearly to what we had been been hearing. And uh, that was that was good news. And again, I got that from my man, uh, uh, Nick Murray, 
Oh, hold on just a second. Um, I got a couple of Nick Murray back books back there. And if you're looking to go into this business of financial advisory, uh, the new financial advisor is the book you need to read for sure. But uh, all right, love to hear your comments below. Um, no, I'd, I'd love to hear them because this is one that I don't have a, uh, you know, I'm wishy-washy. All right, we'll see you now. So uh, smash the like button and we'll see you next time.